All right, dealing with divorce, difficult questions, biblical answers. This is lesson number 12. Uh, the title of this lesson, Divorce Busters and Part Two. We started part one last week. So last week um, in our lesson I shared with you seven suggestions to help those who are not married yet, uh, to help them avoid a divorce once they do get married. So the, the lesson was directed at those who are not yet married. Now for those of you who weren't here, the seven suggestions to avoid divorce before you marry, let me just review those, I'll go over them real quick. Uh, number one, marry a strong Christian. Number two, consider your parents' objections. If your folks have objections, make sure you pay attention. Number three, observe your partner's parents because you'll find a clue there uh, on how they treat each other, you'll find a clue as to how your partner may be trained in his growing up or her growing up to treat you. Uh, number four, don't marry a user. By a user, I mean someone who abuses, abuses drugs, food, alcohol, whatever. Don't, don't marry an abuser. Number five, um, observe how your partner handles money. Because I mentioned uh, last week that uh, most conflicts, especially early on in marriage, is about how to handle money. So observe how your future partner handles money. Number six, don't marry a liar. Of course, you know, the basic element that maintains a marriage is trust. So if your future uh, husband or wife has uh, problems with the truth, uh, beware. And then number seven, make sure your future spouse can hold down a job because it's a long life living with someone who doesn't like to work or can't hold down a job. Now, uh, a lot of you who are already married may have said, boy, I wish uh, somebody would have preached this to me before I got married 35 years ago, but it's never too late to uh, learn something new. All right, so today we're going to continue this subject with a part two lesson dedicated to those who are already married and who want to avoid a divorce in their relationship. So some suggestions as to how to avoid a divorce before you get married today, some suggestions about how to divorce-proof your marriage if you are already into one. Uh, young unmarrieds have a lot of energy, so they, they can take seven suggestions uh, pertaining to their uh, lo lo love life. But married folks, probably a little more worn out, so I only have three suggestions for you on how to uh, prevent a divorce in your, uh, in your marriage. So suggestion number one, here we go. Know the difference between a contract and a commitment. So for married people, you want to avoid divorce. Suggestion number one, know the difference between a contract and a commitment. Most divorces take place because people do not understand the fundamental difference between these two things. So let's look at these, shall we? Number one, a contract. What's a contract? A contract is a legal arrangement between two parties to render services or products or conduct according to the terms of a document, something signed between two people. A marriage contract is a legal arrangement between a man and a woman to live as husband and wife and fulfill certain duties regarding children and property. That's what a marriage contract, you know, that, that marriage certificate that you sign, that's what that is. Like all contracts, there is an escape clause in case things do not work out well. In a marriage contract, the escape clause is called divorce. Now many who see marriage as nothing more than a contract think nothing of using the escape clause when things don't suit them. And this is the basic attitude about marriage in our society today. All the ideas about you know, having a prenup and all that business, you know, it, uh, you know, that, that's defining how the escape clause is going to work if you, if you plan on triggering the escape clause. And why is that prenup there? Because the people are seeing this marriage as a contract between the two of them. If it doesn't work, we'll work out the legalities of splitting up ahead of time, imagine. All right, now, I said the, the, the best way to preserve your marriage, know the difference between a contract 
and a commitment. All right, let's look at what a commitment is. A commitment is a promise. It's a vow. Uh, it's a covenant that one person takes upon himself or upon herself. When you commit, you are promising that regardless of what other people do, you will act or do or accomplish a certain thing. That's what a commitment is. In other words, your behavior is based on your commitment, not your partner's behavior. See the difference between contract and commitment? In a marriage context, a, context, a commitment is the promise to be the husband or the wife regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the outcome. That's what a commitment is. In a marriage commitment, there's no escape clause other than the death of the partner. Yes, of course, Jesus added adultery, and I believe the Bible teaches that Paul also added, added abandonment, but this is because of sin. However, the only legitimate out clause is the death of the partner. You know, I've said in other, you know, other classes about divorce, you know, it, God didn't say it was impossible to have a divorce. Of course it's possible to have a divorce. And when you have a divorce, the marriage is over in the eyes of man, in the eyes of God. Yeah, it's possible to have a divorce, but that's not a righteous way to dissolve a marriage. The only righteous way that a marriage is dissolved is with the death of one of the partners. Okay. So when God instituted marriage at the beginning, it was with the idea that both partners would be committed to each other until death. That's the ideal. Matthew 19, 6. Marriages end in divorce because the partners many times only see themselves in a contracted union instead of a committed union. Now commitment to each other in practical terms means certain things. First of all, it means a commitment to fidelity. A sincere commitment in marriage is expressed as an absolute and complete fidelity to the partner. Regardless of how our partner acts, we never have a legitimate reason to be with another person. In a committed relationship, that's how this works. A commitment to each other in practical practical terms also means a commitment to love. Many times there's no love in a relationship because we have stopped putting our love into it. Marriages, you know, they thrive on love and a, and a commitment to marriage to a spouse is not simply a commitment to keeping our body there, but also a commitment to keeping our heart there as well. And then of course, a commitment to service. Many marriages crash because of neglect. Number one reason, neglect. You know, yes, other things happen many times. You know, uh, there may be adultery, there may be other things that go on, there may be the misuse of money, there may be abuse, there, you know, all kinds of things that happen, but usually those don't just happen, boom, right away. Usually there's neglect or carelessness. You know, marriage, Marriage and the marriage bond, you know, it's a fragile thing. It doesn't take much you know, to put cracks in it and to, you know, to damage the thing. We have to be careful. And then a commitment to service. As I say, marriages crash through neglect. The job, the hobby, the friends, the family, these take precedence over the marriage and it just doesn't seem important anymore. You know, I hear men sometimes say, look, I'm, doing, you know, I'm working hard and I'm, I'm putting in 90 hours a week, so there's no time for anything except work, but look, I'm providing all of this. Yes, you're providing for the house, but you're not providing for the marriage. You're not providing for the relationship. I'm not saying we can't work hard and you know, build our businesses, our careers, but we have to find some sort of balance there. When, when, when we're working to the point where we just neglect our marriage, what's the point? What's the point if you pay off your house in seven years, but you're divorced in 10? What's the point? Nothing there. So if you understand what commitment is, then you won't consider divorce as any kind of solution when things get rough. For example, I give an example here. 
You know, um, <clears throat> when people have a stroke, one of the common uh, side effects uh, or, or, or results of a stroke is many times persons are paralyzed on either one side or the other of their body. And if they, many times they don't recover the use of their arm. I've, that's the most common thing that I've seen. And so you see people who have a stroke, who've had a stroke, they're walking around and, and their arm is no longer functional. It just hangs there. It's an appendage. You know? They can't pick anything up. It has no, you know, no use whatsoever. Imagine if you went up to a person who had a stroke and they had this arm here not doing anything. And you said to them, you know what, that, your right arm there, I mean, that, that thing must be getting in the way. It must be tough you know, putting it in through a shirt sleeve. And How about we just amputate that sucker? Why don't we just cut it off? What do you think that most people would say? Are you kidding me? That's my arm. <laughs> you cannot take my arm. Yeah, it doesn't work properly, but you're not taking my arm away from me. Most people would say that. Imagine, in the, imagine this example now in a marriage. So the partner has had a nervous breakdown or the partner has, I don't know, whatever, you know, becomes a, a paraplegic through an accident, something like that. And someone says, you know what? Your marriage partner you know, can't function anymore, can't earn a living anymore, can't support you, can't have sex. You know, I mean, what good is it? You know, why don't you just cut her off? because she's not useful to you anymore, or he's not useful to you anymore. What would people say? Wait a minute, that, that's my wife you're talking about. That's my, that's my partner, she or he. You know? Not the way they used to be, but doesn't matter. It's still my, this is my partner. And so in a, in a commitment relationship, cutting off simply to resolve your issue is not uh, is not one of the options that, that we have. Marriages don't need more money and they don't need more sex to survive. They need commitment as the rock solid foundation upon which the relationship can be built. That's what they need. So suggestion number one, Know the difference between a contract and a commitment if you want your marriage to flourish. Suggestion number two, get some help. Get some help. So many people come to see me after they've called their lawyer or after their partner has left them. Usually too little, too late. If your partner has left you, I mean, I've had this happen to me. You know, the one person comes in, they want to talk about their marriage and they need some help with it. And, you know, and as I ask questions, OK, well, tell me a little bit about what's going on. You know, and what do you think led up to these problems? And they say, oh, well, uh, you know, uh, Johnny or John or whoever, you know, their partner. Oh, no, well, he's in his own apartment now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, he left three months ago and he's in his apartment now. Oh, I say. Yeah, yeah, I thought I'd come see you, maybe you know, help us, can I work on our marriage? <laughs> if John's got his apartment and signed the lease, it just may be a little too late to work on your quote marriage. You should have come and seen me you know, before this happened. You know, let, try to understand, people are sinners. And when you put two sinners together in a relationship for life, there's bound to be trouble. I know during the courting stage, you know, uh, she looks at him and said, you know what, you, you're perfect. And he looks at her and so beautiful, so fresh, you know, and said, no, 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 darling, you're perfect. You're more perfect than I'm perfect. You know, and it's just so wonderful. But then after a while, the perfection starts to wear off and the real person, the normal person, I'm not saying the bad person, just the person kind of comes out there with all of their flaws. So of course, there's bound to be trouble. There's bound to be issues. There, there are bound to be difficulties. The thing is, don't be discouraged by that. Don't let that you know, discourage you and make you quit. You know, accept it. Work with it. Now most times, people can work things out by themselves if they're having issues. But there are times when a couple gets to a, an impasse, a deadlock, a standoff, and they get into this cycle that they can't seem to break. So when this happens, when you get into that, a couple of things to remember. First, swallow your pride. 
A lot of couples will stay in their misery because they're too proud to admit that they're in trouble and they need help. So what they do is they lock into this kind of survival mode and they stay in this survival mode as best they can, sometimes for years, because they're too proud to go to someone. Doesn't matter, their, their mother, their minister, a counselor, they're too proud to say, you know, we're, we're having problems. And they put so much energy into projecting a happy facade for everyone, the neighbors, the family, the church, you know, because they don't want anybody to think that they somehow have failed. And they don't realize that by doing that, they're undermining the very thing that they're trying to save. You know, men are usually more guilty of this than women. They hate to admit that they failed somehow. They don't like to acknowledge that they might need some direction, that they don't know everything, that they can't fix it by themselves. Sometimes one of the partner's attitude is that, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. You're the one that needs the, the counseling. I've seen that a lot. I've, I've, I've had couples sit there and one partner say to the other, I'm here, but I don't need to be here. I'm, I'm here for her. <laughs> Talk to her. <laughs> I'm just here so, you know, so she would come or I'm just here so that he would come. But there's nothing wrong with me, it's him. So, so I, and I've seen this, it's amazing. You know? So the, let's say it's the woman. the woman. The woman kind of partners up with me and together we're going to talk to that guy. That loser, <laughs> we're going to fix him. Or the other way around, you know, we're going to talk to her and fix her problem, whatever it is. That's just, that's just pride. If you've said that, your marriage is in trouble and that means you're in trouble and need help. If you think she's the only one that needs the counseling, well right away there's problem number one. If your marriage is in trouble, then you're in trouble. That's the thing we need to kind of remember. Another point to remember when you, know, when you need to get help, get Christian counseling. There are a lot of counselors, but only Christian counselors will help you redesign your marriage relationship according to God's plan in the Bible. Secular counselors want to get you to do what you really want to do. They may, they may even include divorce. Well, if, if, you know, if you're just not fulfilled and what you really want to do is write and go to, go to Italy and write your novel, well then fine, that's, you, know, you need to yourself to be fulfilled. So maybe you, know, you ought to just you know, jettison your partner. Maybe a little divorce will take care of business. You know. As long as we do it amicably, as long as we're still friends after the divorce. So you can go and write your great novel in Italy and yeah, no. <laughs> Christian counselors will help you know and do what God wants you to do. In the end, this not only brings peace to the relationship, but also brings peace of mind. No one who has been through a divorce feels nothing afterwards, like feels, ah, oh, that was good. I really, ah, oh, yeah, I'm glad I did that. That was a wonderful experience. Finally, I'm free, I, I'm at peace. Nobody feels like that after a divorce. Even the person who is the, quote, victim, okay? Even that person after the divorce still feels hurt and pain and guilt and remorse, and they're the victim. I can't even imagine, I can't even be, begin to tell you what that guilty party feels after they've been through a divorce. So there's no great feeling uh, after a divorce. That's why it's, 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 it's better that we work on the relationship than, you know, there's, there's less emotional damage if you're working on the relationship uh, than if you simply choose an easy divorce to get out. Now, you understand, I, I can't say everything there is to say about divorce in one lesson. I, I recognize, and we've done this a couple of you know, lessons back, 
I, this is not what I would suggest if someone's being abused or beaten. You know, obviously, those are different circumstances. I'm talking in general here. Okay? And then another suggestion, when, when you're at an impasse in a marriage, swallow your pride, get Christian counseling, and be patient. Uh, problems in marriages usually require changes on the part of both parties, and change is usually slow and, and painful. It usually takes time to work yourself into marriage problems, and it also takes time to work yourself out of marriage problems. Once you get help, then give it time to work in your life and in your marriage. The results are really worth waiting for. You know, think of, think of a, a, a tree. You plant, you, you plant a tree, right? You want to get a nice uh, rosebud, you know, a redbud tree. I remember planting a redbud tree uh, in Midwest City a long time ago, and I, I so wanted those redbuds in the spring. Well, you know what? They didn't come the first spring. <laughs> It was just a twig out there. <laughs> but after a couple of years, yeah, that red bud started to sprout and it started to look beautiful. You know? We don't live there anymore, but if I drive by there, that, that tree has continued to grow and, and, and it gives pleasure every, every spring to that household uh, with its, uh, beautiful, uh, its uh, beautiful buds in the spring. Well, you know, fixing a marriage, it takes a season or two for those things to, you know, to, take, to take hold and grow. And if we're patient, we, we, see, the, uh, we see the results. Well, most problems that separate people in marriage are fixable, given the right attitude and teaching. And a lot of times in counseling, I try to explain to people um, the things that you've said to me that, that are wrong in your marriage or that are difficult in your marriage, if I were a physical doctor, I would make the diagnosis that you have, uh, you have pneumonia. Now, if you have pneumonia in this day and age, you're miserable, you got a fever, you're coughing, you're weak, you, know, you, you, you quote, you want to die, but you're not going to die because with medication and rest and so on and so forth, you'll get through this. And in a couple of weeks, two, three weeks, maybe a month, you'll start feeling better again. Well, sometimes marriages have pneumonia. You think that they're going to die, but with, you know, with the right type of uh, adjustments and patience and love, you know, eventually give it a little bit of time, that marriage will be healthy again. Some marriages have terminal cancer. You know, one partner has left the other and has now living with another individual and the woman in that individual is pregnant. Yeah, well that marriage, you know, that, for that marriage, that, that's kind of, yeah, that's over. That's not happening. So sometimes some marriages, yeah, they're damaged beyond repair. Uh, a father abuses sexually their own child, okay, that marriage, you see what I'm saying? So some marriages, yeah, they're beyond repair. But most marriages are not. Couples who are in trouble and seek help early, they need to hang on to Jesus' promise that with God all things are possible, Matthew 19, 26. Even marriages that seem hopelessly in a mess can be fixed and restored if only we trust in the Lord of hopeless causes. You know, my, my thought is, uh, let me get a slide. If God can resurrect Jesus from the dead, He can also resurrect a dead relationship. If we obey, if we trust in Him, if we do what He says. All right, so suggestion number two for those who are married, want to avoid divorce, get help. Get help for your marriage if it's in trouble. And don't, don't feel ashamed like, oh, we ought not to be in trouble. Of course not. I mean, you're two sinners and you're trying to have a relationship for life. Of course there'll be problems. And there'll be some problems you won't be able to fix by yourself. You'll need help. So don't be proud. Get that help. Then suggestion number three. I only have three. Learn to forgive. Learn to forgive. Divorce is the final refusal to forgive. Now I say final unforgiveness, but not first, not first. A divorce is usually preceded by a long series of unforgiven offenses. When we don't bother forgiving or asking for forgiveness for our small offenses, 
we don't learn how to forgive or how to ask for, forgive, uh, for forgiveness when it really counts. You know, we go through, you know, we do things and sometimes on purpose or not on purpose, we offend our, our partner. We hurt their feelings. Imagine, she makes, a, you know, she makes a nice dinner and supper and everything is there and, and 5.30, you know, supposed to be 5.30 and then six o'clock comes and 6.30 and quarter to seven, he comes, he comes rolling in. Oof, it's busy, Oof, okay, come on, I'm ready, let's sit down, let's eat. And she's sitting there, you know, putting the cold whatever, you know, and he says, ah, don't worry, it doesn't matter, I'll eat, you, you're, mm, I love you, you know, I'll eat it cold because your food is so good cold, you know, it doesn't matter, you're such a good cook, let's just eat. And she said, so, and she's, so uh, what happened? I thought you were supposed to be here, you know. Yeah, I got tied up at the office, you know how it is, you know, the boss wanted to talk to me and blah, 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 you know, come on, let's just, let's just eat, yeah, you'll be okay, yeah, don't worry about it, it's not a big deal, you know, it's all right, it's just food, you know. What's wrong there? Well, what's wrong there is that somebody has, is hurt. She's hurt. She went to the trouble of making this meal so that they could enjoy their time together. And she had an expectation that he would be there at a certain time. Is it the end of the world? Well, of course not. It's not the end of the world. Is it a huge thing? No, it's not a huge thing, but it's a thing. It may not be that big, but it's that big. And what was missing there in that little one man play I just put on? What was missing was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So instead of coming in and say, okay, let's see, let's go, blah, blah. Instead of coming in doing that and saying, ah, it's no big deal, I love you, it's fun. It's let's deal with the hurt. I'm sorry, I apologize. I know you were expecting me at a certain time and I should have called and I didn't. I was caught up at the office and I had to make a decision. Should I take an extra minute before I went into the boss's office for the last minute meeting and just call you and say, look, I'm jammed up. You know? And I didn't, I, I let the pressure get to me. I'm sorry, please forgive me because I recognize I am the one in the need of forgiveness at the moment. So this gives her the opportunity to deal with the hurt. So she can do two things. She can say whatever and keep eating or she can say, I understand. That's okay, I forgive you, it's okay. Let's just eat. So that, that little thing there it got taken care of. Because the next time something happens, may not be about that, it'll be about something else, that little unresolved hurt there, that's still here, that's right here. And then the next time something happens like this, and he happens to be the guilty guy, you know, it goes both ways of course, but let's just say it's him, then another one of those little hurts, unresolved, goes here and they keep these things keep adding up. And the net result of that is that when it's her turn to say, please forgive me, because I've done something wrong, whatever it is, she looks at all this hurt and she goes, <laughs> you owe me so much that you don't deserve to be forgiven. She won't articulate it like that, but that's what she'll do. Uh, do you see this cycle starting now? You see how this works? Just keep that going for two years and find out how much love there is in that relationship. So we have to learn to say, please forgive me. There can never be a new start without forgiveness. That's why the first goal of a couple in marriage in trouble is to forgive one another. This even applies to those who have been divorced. There's no healing, there's no new start, there's no new life until forgiveness has taken place. Forgiving the other person for what they've done and forgiving yourself. 
As I say, new life doesn't start when you get a new apartment or even when you remarry. It starts when you forgive. Many folks, you know, they want to forgive, but they're not sure what forgiveness really is or how to go about it. So let's understand now what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is giving up the right to receive payment that you justly deserve. Whether it be the right to an apology or some restitution or some sort of punishment. In forgiveness, we don't just give up our payment, we give up our right to receive payment or even to ask or to refer to it again. That's forgiveness. Let's go back to our cold dinner example. He says, I'm sorry. This probably hurts you, whatever. Those words, please forgive me. I'm going to do better. Next time this happens, I'm going to remember this and you know, I'll be more considerate of your feelings. And she says, OK, I, I forgive you. It's OK. It's not a big deal, but I appreciate you saying that. Let, let's just eat. When she said to him, that's OK, I forgive you. She's giving up the right in the future to refer to this incident again. Because with, with forgiveness comes, I erase that. You don't owe me an apology anymore for this thing because you've asked me, please forgive me. Meaning, can, you know, can we just take this one off the books? So it's not real forgiveness if three months down the road he's late again for dinner, similar scenario, let's just say, and she says, well, I'm used to this. Here we go again, uh-uh-uh. You forgave, that means you gave up the right to ask for payment for this particular, for this particular thing. So a lot of folks want to forgive, as I say, they're not sure what it means. In forgiveness, we don't just give up our payment, as I say, we give up our right to receive the payment. We also sign the right over to Christ. In other words, the other person now owes Jesus what they previously owed to us. They still owe it, but they don't owe it to us anymore. They owe it to God in Christ. We've turned it over to Him in prayer. And if He will demand it of them, then they will have to pay it. For two Christians, that's wonderful. So that Christian couple, please forgive me. She says, yes, I forgive you. The offense goes to Christ and Christ then echoes, yeah, I forgive you too. In the waters of baptism, I've, I've forgiven you that thing as well. For the non-Christian, I forgive you. Uh, now that sin goes to Christ. If that person's not a Christian, ultimately they'll have to answer to the Lord. You know, when he's in Romans, when he says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I'll repay. That's what he means. Those, of, those who have offended you, don't take justice, don't take revenge, leave it to me, trust me, I will take revenge for that. Now in return for this forgiveness, Jesus gives us what? He gives us peace. He gives us peace concerning the issue. We trade anger, resentment, and dire, uh, desire for revenge and hurt, we trade that for peace. And we get a bonus. The Lord also gives us forgiveness for our sins, which He transfers from us to Him as well. So sometimes the stuff, you know, in a, in a divorce, sometimes the stuff is so old, it's so complicated, it's so hurtful that it cannot be untangled. It can't be taken back. We just need to, to wipe the slate clean and forgiveness is the only thing that can do this. I've seen that as well. And I've experienced that as well. You know, something that happened so long ago, you, you ever notice you try to, like you're trying to work it out and you, you, don't, you can't even agree on the details anymore that it's so old. The only, the only way out is, is forgiveness. Some things a couple cannot forget. 
but with God's help they can forgive. And that forgiveness permits them to move on and to start over. Now, for people who are already divorced, you know, it permits them to you know, start over, move on and start over a new life. For people married to one another, hurting one another, it permits them to move on from the hurt. There has to be forgiveness so that you can move on from the hurt. And as I said at the beginning, if you're used to asking and giving forgiveness to one another, then it becomes more easy to do as you go on and you'll find something else. You'll find that you offend each other a lot less. Just works that way. So at the end, uh, this is, uh, you know, at the end of my last lesson, I mentioned that you could have probably added a lot more suggestions to what I said. Remember the seven suggestions to avoid a divorce before you get married? I suppose that this could be true in this lesson as well. But I've picked three things that from my own experience in counseling that I've seen over and over again. Now I'm confident that most divorces that take place, whether they be among Christians or non-Christian couples, could be avoided, and we do a little review, First of all, if people would enter into the marriage with a commitment mindset rather than a contract mindset. This would eliminate divorce as an option when things get rough and motivate the couple to really work on their problems instead of you know, taking what seems the easy way out. Trust me, divorce is never the easy way out. It's always painful, always. Number two, People would not wait so long to get help when they start having problems. In other words, could avoid, avoid divorce if they got help sooner rather than later. We don't hesitate. You know, here's the point. If our transmission is not you know, rattling in our car, you know, something, we don't hesitate to take it to the garage. And the guy said, well, man, that's, that's going to be $1,900 to fix that up. Oh, man, well, you'll say, well. I got to do it. I need my car, you know, and you'll put it on the old credit card, something, fix that, that car. And yet, when our marriages start to, you know, start to rattle, we're afraid to spend five cents. You know, how much is a counselor? Well, it's $100 a visit. Oof, I don't know. And the counselor says, well, you know, considering you know, some of the issues that you people have, I think maybe, you know, a dozen or so sessions might help, you know, might get us back on track. Oof, $1,200 just to sit and talk, I don't know. Yeah, we'll invest 1,200 bucks in a 10-year-old car, but we won't do it in a 10-year-old marriage. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. And then number three, we could avoid divorce if people would invest as much emotional energy into forgiving each other as they do in winning the argument or fighting with each other. Forgiveness is an integral part of building a healthy relationship and if you want to live in peace you have to learn how to ask and give forgiveness because forgiveness is the best kind of closure. Best kind of closure because it gives you a push forward. If you've asked for forgiveness sincerely and understood what, what it is that you've done to hurt your partner and if you've offered forgiveness sincerely because you understand that your partner needs this and you know you need this to move on, your marriage gets like new life after that. You're at another level. The other one thing before we close out I want to say is that when you have forgiven one another for an issue or something like that, your marriage feels so much stronger after that. Why? Because a thing at the level of what happened before will no longer slow you down. The being late for supper thing, you know, that might not happen again and if it does, you've already you know, learned how to work that one out quickly. Lisa and I, you know, uh, we've been married uh, 38 years and the thing that we've noticed in 38 years, we used to call them uh, fender benders. 
fender benders, meaning we'd have an accident, we'd crash into each other, we'd have a fender bender because a misunderstanding, you know, one word too many, uh, making a little joke at the wrong time, you know, fender benders. And I remember when we were first married, the you know, first couple of years, you know, we'd lay in bed and talk about it. You know, and it'd be four o'clock in the morning, we're still yakking about it and working it out. And she'd say, OK, enough. It may not be settled, but I've got to get some sleep. I've got four kids that are going to be up in an hour. You know? And well, the thing we've noticed you know, as, as we've been married longer and longer and longer is that the fender benders hardly ever happen now. But when they do, they're resolved in about 11 seconds. Because what we have is so wonderful, we don't want to even waste 10 minutes. You know. We've learned how to get through those things more quickly. And that's not, not because we're extra special. Everybody can do that if, if we learn how to forgive each other and we practice that. OK, that's our lesson for today. Uh, next time, uh, our capstone lesson in this series called Love and Marriage. We want to finish really on a positive note, so that'll be for next time. Thank you for your attention.